Have you ever noticed that throughout the Bible there are several different places where that it may be like a clay pot, a vase, or a cup that the Lord will use as a representation or to illustrate a vessel, and he uses that to bring out about our vessel, this spirit, this soul, uh, this tabernacle where that the Spirit of God is supposed to dwell. Anybody else seen that before? And so this is the place where the presence and the Spirit of God is supposed to inhabit, and this is the place where the righteousness of God is supposed to be. And this, this is the vessel where we are to receive the goodness of God. And I'm thankful for that. Uh, but the, the more I thought about our vessel this week, the more the Lord just kept dealing with me to preach a message to the church on the condition and, and I've talked a little bit about some of these things years throughout the years, I guess, but this particular message was dealing specifically with the condition and the position of a vessel. So I believe that when we know about the vessel in the Bible, and I believe that when we know this is the vessel, the tabernacle of the Lord, that we realize we have a responsibility to make sure this vessel is in the right condition, and it's in the right position. You agree? Say amen. Uh, if you look, you consider the analogy of a vessel that the Lord used with Israel when he spoke through the prophet Jeremiah. And I want to look at the text in Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 4. If you have that, we're going to start Jeremiah chapter 2, and we're going to start with verse number 4. That's Jeremiah 2 and 4, and we're going to read through to verse number 13 this morning. So Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 4. If you want to stand for the reading of the Word of God, you can go ahead and do that now. So Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 4. The Bible says here, Hear ye the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, What iniquity have your fathers found in me, that they are gone far from me and have walked after vanity, and are become vain. Neither said they, Where is the Lord that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, that led us through the wilderness, through a land of deserts and of pits, through a land of drought and of the shadow of death, through a land that no man passeth through and where no man dwelt? And I brought you into a plentiful country, to eat the fruit thereof and the goodness thereof. But when you entered, you defiled my land and made mine heritage an abomination. The priest said not, where is the Lord? They that handle the law knew me not. The pastors also transgressed against me. And the prophets prophesied by Baal and walked after things that do not profit. Wherefore, I will yet plead with you, saith the Lord, and with your children's children will I plead. Now listen to verse 10. For pass over the isles of Chittim and see, and send unto Kedar, and consider diligently, and see if there be such a thing. Hath a nation changed their gods, which are yet no gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which doth not profit." Be astonished, O ye heavens, at this. Be horribly afraid. Be ye very desolate, saith the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. 
They have forsaken me. Somebody say they have forsaken him. That's the first thing. And what the second thing is, they have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and secondly, hewed them out, cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. With the Lord's help this morning, we're going to pray one more time. We've prayed several times throughout this service, but I just feel impressed to pray right here at this very junction of the sermon and ask the Lord to have his way on several parts of this that I I believe personally are going to deal with people in a very specific way. Father, as I come before heaven's throne one more time, I'm asking you to specifically, expressly use the words that are about to be spoken to deal with hearts and lives in a very unique way, a way like only you can cultivate in them the things that need to be cultivated, turn over the broken clods of dirt and fallow ground that you may plant in the right things, righteousness, holiness, pure living, and a pure desire for the things of God. I pray this morning, Lord, that you'll give me the boldness to speak the Word of God and the love of Christ to deliver it in the most beautiful way We'll give you praise and glory for everything that is accomplished here this morning, and everyone can say amen. And you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. As you and I look closely at what the Lord sent prophet Jeremiah to proclaim to the people, we would begin to see that the people were backslid. This is a backslidden condition of the people of Israel, and this is the way the the Lord sees it through his eyes. It's one thing for us this morning to look at our own self and say, well, when I look at my next door neighbor, I'm a pretty good old fellow. I don't, I don't do too much wrong. You know, I look at him, I, I pay my tithes. He don't pay his tithes. You know, I look at me, I'm, look at me, I'm doing pretty good. You know, the ways of a man are right in his own eyes. Did you know that? A lot of times it's easy for us to overestimate and not realize the inadequacy in our own lives. But I think that the true statement or the true way of looking at this should be, and I've prayed this so many times throughout my life in serving the Lord, Lord, I don't want to see me as I see me. Lord, let me see what you see when you look at me. Anyone else see what I'm saying? Now, if I look at me and I analyze me, I might come up with a different analyzation. But if the Lord looks at me, he's going to see things that I may not see. Do you agree with that? So when I look at this particular portion of the text, I see the Lord doing this very thing as he evaluates the place that Israel is in. He starts off throughout the text and he begins to question his people Israel. And he shows us that I have been just, I have been holy, I've been a righteous giving God, I've done for my people. And he begins to question them, have you seen me do anything that would be other than that? Have you ever seen me do anything evil? Have you ever seen me not be a fortifying and a plenteous kind of God? Is there any ill way, is there any reason why that you would not serve me? Have you ever seen people that just refuse to serve God? And yet God has been so good to them. And you think to yourself, why would you not serve God? He's been so good to you in so many ways. But the Lord goes on in the text to tell them how many different various ways that he has blessed them and how that they have been foolish and followed the abominations of false gods. And if that is not enough, He goes on to point out how that even the pastors and the prophets have falsely prophesied by Baal and by other gods. Someone say that is a stench in the nostrils of God. That's a shame. So the Lord goes on to do something that I want us to focus a little attention on because if you read right over, skim right over the text, you may not get this. The Lord begs of them. He says, I don't just want you to do this. I want your children and your children's children to do this. I want you to search far and wide, and I want you to consider 
the other heathen nations that are all round about. And how that these heathen nations are so loyal to their false gods. Somebody say false. They are so loyal to their Buddhas and their Baals and their Ashtaroths and Ashdods. And they are so loyal to these false gods. And I want you to search far and wide and I want you to see how loyal that all of these other people are to false gods while that Israel has been, they've waffled back and forth. They can't make up their mind to serve the one true and living God. Oh, what a shame that it is. And so he goes on to explain that in his eyes that they are like broken cisterns that can hold no water. Now, a cistern, in effect, we could just imagine a a clay jar or a clay pot. So if you get that in your mind this morning, you can see like an old uh, antique, maybe a Bible historical vessel that is made of some sort of pottery. And that cistern, that vessel that is designed to hold water, the intent, the reason that it is made is to hold water. You don't make the vessel just to sit it on a shelf. Now, I know that I don't know how they do things in Trinidad, but in America, we do weird things over here. We'll take a vessel that, we'll take a jar that's broken, stick it up on the shelf. You know, I know that's decoration in our country. And I believe that there might be a reason for that. I don't know. But you don't typically make a vessel so that it does not do its intended purpose. If you create a vase or a jar or a a pot, you're creating it to house or to contain or to hold something. And so the very reason for a vessel is that it may contain and that it may hold whatever water or thing that is poured in it. So this analogy that the Lord gave was not that they had literally fashioned actual cisterns. He was giving a typical or a typology of what he was trying to show them, an analogy, if you will, that your life, your lifestyle, your spirit man, your vessel, It's much like the potter's house where they might make a vessel and it's got cracks and it's got holes in it. It's got voids in it that when you pour in something, that whatever you pour in just leaks right back out. Have you ever heard the analogy before that it's like pouring water in buckets with holes in them? Uh, You know, in the United States, I'm not trying to be political here, but some of you remember the stimulus money that was pumped into America and no matter what side everybody Republicans have done it Democrats have done it people have done it and sometimes it is a necessary thing to keep an economy afloat for a short period of time but whenever they began to do that sometimes uh, the analogy fits because it's like pouring water into a bucket full of holes Uh, you go out to Home Depot get you one of them orange buckets uh, and you put drill some holes in it pour it full of water and you're going to see that it may fill up in the short term but eventually all the water is going to pour out and that is somewhat the analogy that the Lord is giving here he said you are broken cisterns you've hewn you out you have you have developed and you have evolved into a people whose lifestyle is like a jar or a clay pot that when I pour in that you never retain somebody say retain you never retain what I have poured into you. So it's meant to typify their actions which were likened unto someone who had made a vessel and the vessel ended up having so many flaws that it could never retain the water. You see for Israel the flawed creation was a product of their poor choices and their plans. Do you understand this morning that you can make the wrong choices and the wrong plans in life that can cause you to have a leaky vessel when it comes to the spiritual things of the Lord? You can have a lifestyle that you choose to pursue which is going to glorify everything but God. 
I've watched people that have been on church pews. They've had the victory, but they began to yield themselves to ungodly things. They began to make poor choices and glorify everything but God. And eventually what happens, they get to the place where they miss a service here, miss a service there. Does that happen over in Trinidad? Says, hey, they miss here, miss there. Next thing you know, you don't see them in church ever again. And a lot of the reason is, uh, is they begin to glorify everything but God. So the Lord says, your life to me, uh, it looks more like a clay vessel with cracks and broken places in it. And no matter how much water that I pour on you or in you, it always leaks out nearly as quickly as I pour it in. And I got to thinking to myself, I know we've been around church for a while, so some of you will know exactly what I mean. Have you ever wondered to yourself why there are some people that never, ever seem to have any lasting victory in their life? Have you ever church with anybody? They're always on the bottom. They're always on the downside. They never have any victory. And if they do, it's very short-lived. I mean, they get a breakthrough in the altar on Sunday morning, and by Monday morning or two days later, they've already lost the victory. The reason is, is that their life is much like a broken cistern, a jar, or a clay, or a pot thing that has got holes, and as soon as they get poured in, it always pours right back out. It's not that they don't get anything. It's not that they don't feel anything. It's not that they don't feel the anointing of the Holy Ghost. But for some reason or another, they get a little, but they never hold on to what they get. They're always broken spiritually. But I can tell you that like Israel, their leaking vessel is a product of a life that is not fully given over to Christ. You show me somebody sold out and I'll show you somebody that don't need flex seal. I'll show you somebody that's got all the cracks sealed up. They've got a jar or a vessel that'll hold the water of the Spirit. They've got a vessel that's got the power of the Holy Ghost. You show me somebody fully dedicated. And here's what the Lord says. He said, pass over the land of Shittim and unto Gadar. Tell me if you see a nation that serves false gods that's waffling back and forth as to what they're going to serve. It's a shame in the house of God when drunks sitting on bar stools and meth addicts with needles uh, and drug dealers with the drug cartel are more faithful and loyal to what they do than the people of God are loyal to what they do. Come on now. Come on now. It's a shame when the Moose Lodge has got more loyalty than the house of God. It's more, it's a shame when the VFW has got more loyalty. It's a shame when Star Wars fan clubs got more loyalty than the people of God. Come on now. Huh? It's a shame whenever NASCAR's got more loyalty than the people of God. I'm asking you here this morning, uh, where is our loyalty? What are we loyal to? God said, I want you to search far and wide, and I want you to see how the heathen rages. Uh, they may be serving Baal, but they're not serving Baal today and something else tomorrow. They are loyal to whatever they are loyal to. Somebody say, oh God, help us all. In verse number 11, he says, hath a nation, this is what he talks about other, other pe- people, and he says, hath a nation changed their gods, which are yet no gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which doth not profit. In other words, you are serving stuff that's no benefit to you. It may feel good in the short term, but in the long run, it's causing you problems. In the short term, your flesh feels good. But in the long term, your spirit man's always bankrupt and empty. Oh, if you'd only concern yourself with the things uh, that fortify and edify and glorify the things of God, do you know how much better off you'd be instead of chasing every ungodly carnal thing of the world? Say amen, somebody. You see, these people were not fully surrendered, so they were never completely filled. I'm here to tell you that if there's a, if for some reason that your life feels like you never completely get full and stay full for very long, 
it is a product in most every case of the fact that you, whether you realize it or even want to admit it, are not fully sold out to God. I don't know how to say it any plainer than that. Somebody say, help the pastor this morning. But you see, this is where we see the condition. Somebody say that condition. The condition of the vessel. This is where the water is leaking out as fast as the water is poured in. Because Jehovah, you see, was just one of the many things they chose to serve. And not the only one they chose to serve. He was just one among many things that had become priority in their life. Not the one prim, uh, primary uh, uh, principle and priority in their life. He was not at the top of the list. He was somewhere in the middle or maybe down at the bottom or maybe not even on the list. And that's where a lot of people I see today. But could it be that the reason that we've come to church on Sunday and we get filled or we feel that living water poured onto us only to feel yourself empty and void come Monday morning is it because of the condition of your vessel? You're not fully sold out to God. Is it because you're trying to squeeze God into everything else that you refuse to let go of are the things in your life you just completely refuse to let go of I don't want to split hairs here over stuff but I will tell you I've had times in the past where people have looked me and my wife right in the face and said I'll tell you one thing I'll never do that in other words there are some things that the Lord, I don't, care who, I don't care if the Lord dealt with me, I would never do that. You get that kind of spirit, you're in bad shape. You're cisterns, broken cisterns that will hold no water. Say amen, somebody. But that's the condition of the vessel. But I want to take it a little step further as the Lord led me and show you not just the condition of the broken vessels that will hold no water, but the Lord pointed me to the vessels that never obtain all the water because of their position. In other words, one vessel cannot retain it all because it's a leaking vessel and another vessel cannot obtain it all because it's not a positional vessel. I want to show you what I'm talking about. Ever wondered why that two people can sit in the same service, hear the same sermon, feel the same anointing, pray in the same altar, and two people come out of that service and one leaves filled and one leaves empty? You ever wonder why that is? I can tell you the reason is that in John chapter 15, verse 6 through 8, it shows us how the abundance of our fruit-bearing potential potential is subject to our position in God. He said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so shall you be in my, be my disciples. In other words, uh, the position is you abide in me. You've got to be in the right position. You're abiding in that vine. You see, there was a promise given to the New Testament church in the book of Acts. Some of you may have read this before, but it says in Acts chapter 2 and verse 17, And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. Listen to me. The same way that 120 in the upper room had to be positioned where and how the Lord told them to be, you and I must too be specifically positioned to receive when the Lord pours out. When the Lord pours out. Because He will pour out. But to be haphazard, foolish. I asked my wife to help me out with this. But imagine this morning, Brother Jesse, you might have to help me out here, that the Lord says, I'm going to pour into your life. It's Sunday morning, and Brother Kevin, God's decided he's going to pour into Kevin this morning. But if he starts pouring and the vessel's not under the water, the water doesn't go in the vessel. 
But what if he starts pouring in the vessel? He's only partway in the water. Some goes in, some doesn't go in. What if the Lord starts pouring out and you're positioned right up underneath that spout when the water's coming out? You get everything God's begun to pour into you. I guarantee you I'm not the only one that's ever been in a service where I was so distracted and I had so much other foolishness going on in my life that when the Lord started pouring out, if I could move that vessel around, I mean, some might have splashed in here and some splashed in there, and I left that church service with just a dab will do you, and the reason wasn't because God wasn't pouring out. And you look over at your next door neighbor, and they got a full glass, and you're thinking there's a mother. That must not have been God. Why are they shouting? Why did they get baptized in the Holy Ghost? And why did not get filled? Why did not get called? Why don't I get used? Uh, honey, you got to position yourself in the right place. In other words, uh, that when you go to the throne of God, you got to understand when the Lord is pouring out, God, I want to be directly underneath that spout. I don't want one drop to be lost. Uh, I don't want one answer to be lost. Uh, I don't want one healing to be lost. Uh, I don't want to be to the left. I don't want to be too far to the right. God, if this is where I'm supposed to be, let me get where I'm supposed to be and stay there. Oh, yeah, this may sound strange. That if I heard preachers when I first got saved, they would say things like, yeah, we got revival coming up, and you don't want to miss this revival. And the preacher might look around the room and say, how many people wants to be filled with the Holy Ghost? And, yeah, I want to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Don't miss one night of this revival. Be a sad thing if the night God was going to fill you with the Holy Ghost, you were not. That's the way it is for a lot of people. Because whenever God's trying to pour out, come here, Sister Myers, and help me for a minute. There are times, I want you to just move this thing around for me. This is a representation of some, how some of you are too busy for God. You don't have time for God. You got time for Walmart. You got time for your boss. You got time for everything but God. And God's trying to pour out, and, and you're just constantly here and there and everywhere else. You won't stay still long enough for God to even bless you. Well, I ain't got time for church. What is church? Church. Who's, I don't, this is 2022. I'll watch a service online. Come here, Sister Myers. I'll watch a service online. I'll, I'll catch me about two minutes over this church of having church, and I'll catch three minutes of that church having church. And you wonder why you can't never get everything that God's got for you. i tell you why. Because you're never in the position for the vessel to receive everything it could. You see, the first kind of vessel, it's got a messed up condition. And that vessel, it can't retain it because it's got holes and voids and it's got places where it's leaking out. But this vessel, it can't obtain the, the, the water because it's never in the right position. Let me tell you, if the Lord's there, you better be there. Think about that woman with an issue of blood. Say amen. That, that woman with an issue of blood got out of bed. I don't know if she crawled on her hands and knees. I don't know. But she wanted to get in position. I wonder how many wants to get in position. I wonder this morning how many says, I want to be in position when the Holy Ghost is poured out. I wonder how many says, I want a healing. And Sister Margaret, this morning she stepped out. She felt the presence of God. And you know what you were doing, sis? You said, I want to be in the position. I hadn't even preached my message and you were already getting in position because when the Lord is passing by, do you know how many times that I've seen people like the pool of Bethesda when the angel would come down at a certain season and instead of folks being close to the coping of the pool, they're hanging out in the back somewhere with their hands folded amen, just talking about nothing and when the angel came down, they were so far away from the pool, they were nowhere near where the blessing came down I'm going to tell you something this morning. It matters how you position yourself. Some of you may be wondering this morning, you say, Pastor Myers, how in the world am I going to position myself any different than I already am? Well, first of all, when you start getting your priorities in line about what's most important to you, and you really, really want the glory of God in your life, you position yourself to receive those blessings of the Lord. How 
Will I get a breakthrough in a prayer meeting if I never have one? How will I ever have a breakthrough in a time of sincere seeking the Lord if I never sincerely seek the Lord? How will I ever get deliverance if I never even take time to call on the Lord? You have got to position yourself in a way that your mouth is wide open saying, Lord, here I am. You know, I was watching... You ever see like, nature worship, not, uh, National Geographic and such? Birds, when they're young, are the ugliest thing. I mean, birds, they, come on now, somebody help me. You may love birds, but when birds are real small and they ain't got the feathers, they're ugly. Yeah, they look like little baby vultures. But you ever see those little baby birds in the nest, and they got the mouth all up, about five or six of them in the nest, and they all got the mouth open. They're hoping that when mom drops some food that she's regurgitated. Isn't that just lovely? That she's regurgitated down so that they can eat her regurgitated food she went and got and brought back. Their little mouth, they're all underneath there. You know, right now I've got a couple rabbits. i got about four or five rabbits in one of my uh, nest boxes for the rabbits that we raise. And I went last night, and I was doing my little maintenance stuff, little... Uh, husbandry they call it and I stopped at this one nest box and I pulled it out of that cage and Brother Coon I got to looking in there and out of whatever it is four or five I got two rabbits in there I think they're getting all the food they look like they done drank every bit of milk mama had they're so fat they're like rolling around inside there you get their little legs look like little stumpy legs and the other ones are real skinny you know why? Because two are getting fed. They are getting in position. When mama hops in that box and she ain't in there very long, they're like, where's mama at? They're running to where it's at. Do you know that's the way it was when I first got saved? You can ask my wife. I'm not kidding you when I tell you this. When I first got saved, I wanted to be in every church service I could be. There was a time when there was a revival across town. I wanted to be in every revival service I could be. I wanted to be wherever the Spirit of the Lord was. I didn't want to be in a dead, dry atmosphere. I wanted to be where God was. I was positioning myself to receive. As a matter of fact, when my wife said something about getting baptized with the Holy Ghost, we had a home church. We could have just said, well, we'll wait till next Sunday. No, we found out that back then they called it the Ferndale Church of God. Now they call it something else. But it was the Ferndale Church of God. We went to the Ferndale Church of God during a revival and during a revival at somebody else's church, she got down and prayed when everybody else left that night and there we were. She was praying and got broke through and filled with the Holy Ghost. You know why? Because we sought to get in the right position. If you say, Lord, I want to be saved, get in position. You say, Lord, I want to be healed, get in position. You say, Lord, I need to be delivered, get in position. The problem with some people, they're like the fella that the pastor told me about years ago. I don't know if you ever heard me tell this, but I kind of chuckle. I mean, I know it's crazy and sad, but I kind of chuckle because people to me are funny sometimes. But I had a pastor friend of mine. He was evangelizing, I think. But he said he went to one church, and he was preaching about deliverance. And he said, a bunch of people came to the altar. He said, this one fellow came to the altar. He's just praying to different people. He went over to this one guy. And uh, it was pretty obvious that him and, I don't know, Marlboro or Camel or Lucky Strike had a relationship. And he began to pray with this man. Lord, help him, Jesus, that guy. Oh, yes, God, help me, Jesus. Lord, give him a breakthrough. Yes, God, give me a breakthrough. He said, Lord, deliver him of them cigarettes. And that man opened his eyes, stopped looking at him. No. <laughs> he said, I like my cigarettes. <laughs> That's what he said. He stopped the preacher in midstream. He said, no, I like my cigarettes. Don't pray that. <laughs> That's what he said. You know, the reason was because you have got, if you really want a specific thing, I'm not here to criticize anybody. I'm here to tell you that when you want a specific thing, you've got to position yourself for that thing. You say, Lord, I want a better marriage. You've got to position yourself for that very thing. Come on now and say amen. To position yourself, you might need to go down to the gas station and buy a cheap rolls or something, man. If you're going to position yourself, you got to start doing the things that line up with receiving. 
you could start by just being in the right place. I can tell you this this morning, that there's a lot of times, I can't tell you how many times that I've given an altar call. And I say, Lord, would you please this morning save, deliver, heal, help, give answers, give breakthroughs. So the Lord's there in the altar and he's pouring out. While somebody else didn't even bother to get up and go to the altar position. If I'm not in the condition that I need to be in this morning, Sister Myers, you going to play the piano this morning? Can you get Miranda to help me? If I'm not in the right condition that I should be, rather than sitting around and feeling sorry for myself and making a thousand excuses, I say, God, I'm going to the altar, and I pray that you'll work on me. Form that clay. Squeeze that clay between your fingers till it squirts out between your fingers and mash it all up and make it right. Put it on the potter's wheel and mold it like you want it molded, oh God, until that this clay is in the condition that it needs to be in. And Lord, if there are things in my life that I'm supposed to be doing, if there are things I'm supposed to be accomplishing, help me to get in the right position. I want you to understand something. I don't know why I feel like telling you this. In 2008, I was pastoring in Mayaka City Church of God, and I love the people there. Very much so. I had become friends with some of the people, and we dearly loved them. But Brother Eric, the Lord had put a shift in my spirit that it was time for me to move on. For me to do that, I've got to change my position. I have found that the older that we get, the more we don't like change. The change is uncomfortable. But sometimes there are places of our life that that position that God's trying to put us in, get us in, requires change. Brother Matt, I'm sure that it was hard for you guys to make the change. It may have been a little difficult. You get close to people. You have people that you feel fellowship with, become friends with. You may have felt people that somehow or another they were like family. But there comes a time when you know that God has something for you. You have to make the decision to get in position. I'm just obeying the Lord here. I don't know why I feel like telling this, but some of you have heard this part of my testimony before. But this is what happened with me. I had friends and people in ministry that they thought the will of God for me was what they thought. Be very careful that you don't let other people persuade you or make decisions for you. Not a mama, not a daddy, not a friend, not a cousin, not a co-worker. You have to follow the leading of the Lord. I prayed and I sought the Lord and I started talking to people and I said, you know, I don't know what to do. I said, I feel like God's given me a release from this church that I'm at. And I have different people telling me, I think you should do this and I think you should do that. Well, there happened to be one season of my life. Sister Miranda, if you will go ahead and play, please, honey. There happened to be one particular season of my life that I ended up not knowing what the next step for us was. And... That was probably one of the hardest seasons of my entire ministry. That place of not knowing is so miserable, so uncomfortable. And so you've heard me possibly tell of how that I went to a church, a midweek service. There was nothing big and special about that particular service. It was a typical midweek church service. The pastor preached a atypical sermon, good man, you know, but that night, 
Sister Linda, I went down to the altar, and it just so happened that night, because I kept trying to put myself in the position to receive the answer. I'd prayed three months for God. Over three months, Lord, show me what's next for my family. I didn't know what to do. And it was that night when I put myself in position in an altar in an ordinary old church service. The Lord spoke to me that night and said, this is where I want you. People will not understand it, but this is where I want you. You've probably heard me tell that before. But I told you all that because... On the way home, I had a man that was one of my closest ministry friends. And I was excited. After three months, I finally got an answer. I called him on the phone. And I said, hey, brother, I said, I finally got an answer. And Oh, that's, that's great and everything. And what did the Lord say? I said, well, I was down at this church, and the Lord spoke to me and said, this is where I want you. And people won't understand it, but this is where I want you. He started laughing. Really? As if that was the stupidest thing he had ever heard. It kind of took me back. I, I didn't even know. Yeah, he was laughing like that didn't make no sense. And this is what he said to me. The church of God? Brother, are you sure? The church of God? That's what he said. I said, I don't know, brother, so I'm just telling you what the Lord said to me. Okay, so he was laughing. He thought that was hilarious. And I'm not making light of his situation, but I'm now licensed in the church of God. I've been pastoring here for almost 15 years, pastored the last church almost two years. Right? And it's sad to say that man backslid, fell out of ministry, divorced his wife, and is no longer doing what he should be doing. I told you that to tell you, you got to be careful not to let other people persuade you whenever God has a position for you. When someone else says, well, I don't know that I would do that. Well, there might be times that people give you good counsel, but you better make sure that you know that you know that if God is dealing with you about a particular position in your life, that your decision is not framed and it's not governed by what other people say or think. Huh? Stand to your feet across the Lord's house, if you will. One of the things that I can assure you of, I've had numerous opportunities through the years When someone would call me and they were having problems in their church. And they say, Pastor Myers, we're having all kind of problems in our church. And we're praying about leaving. I've had so many opportunities to tell somebody, y'all come on over to Grace Street. But I made up my mind a long time ago. There are people that aren't supposed to be at Grace Street. And if they're not supposed to be there, I don't want them there. You know why? As much as I like to build this church up, there are some people that just don't belong in certain places. I've had some people cause me more problems than they were worth. Because they weren't meant to be there. So I made up my mind a long time ago. If they're having problems somewhere else, and I'll be praying for them. All right, we'll pray for you. We love you. And until they tell me we're thinking about coming to your church, I'm not going to do anything to persuade them any otherwise. Because I don't want them thinking we'll give you a position if you'll come to our church. I'll do thus and so if you come to our church. I want them to make up their minds so that when they get there, it's not about, well, they promised me that I could be the youth director, they promised me I'd be the head choir leader or something, but they went there because they felt that it was the will of God. Does that understand? You understand what I'm saying? Because I'm just trying to help you understand that you cannot let someone else persuade your decision of what the Lord has been dealing with you. As you bow your heads this morning, I wonder, have you been running busy back to and fro, out of position? Have you had a leaking vessel because you haven't been fully surrendered? If that's you this morning or you think it might even possibly be you, I want you by faith to humbly step out of the alt- out and come to the altar this morning and find a place where you can get down and say, Lord, forgive me. Start by simply saying, God, forgive me. That's where you start. 
It's not that you've never been to church and you've never had a splash here and a splash there and you felt good here and there. It's that you're having a struggle to either retain it or you're never in the right position long enough to obtain it. God, help me work on the condition and the position of this vessel. Saints of God, if you're here this morning and you don't feel the Lord leading you to pray, I expect you to come help me pray for these that are praying in the altar this morning. So come on, let's pray this morning. Father, through the precious name of Jesus, Lord, I'm asking you, God, to work on our condition and position in you. Lord, if there be areas of our life where the vessel's marred, oh, this vessel's leaking, I come to church and I feel something and I feel good and I go home and no sooner than I get home, I'm just as bad as I was before. Lord, if that's me, forgive me. If that's me, God, help me in Jesus' name.